The Man Who Found Out by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Found Out A Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood Professor Mark Ebor, the scientist, led a double life, and the only persons who knew it were his assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, and his publishers. But a double life need not always be a bad one, and, as Dr. Laidlaw and the gratified publishers well knew, the parallel lives of this particular man were equally good, and indefinitely produced would certainly have ended in a heaven somewhere that can suitably contain such strangely opposite characteristics as his remarkable personality combined. For Mark Ebor, F.R.S., etc., etc., was that unique combination hardly ever met with in actual life, a man of science and a mystic. As the first, his name stood in the gallery of the great, and as the second, ah, but there came the mystery, for under the pseudonym of Pilgrim, the author of that brilliant series of books that appealed to so many, his identity was as well concealed as that of the anonymous writer of the weather reports in a daily newspaper. Thousands read the sanguine, optimistic, stimulating little books that issued annually from the pen of Pilgrim, and thousands bore their daily burdens better for having read, while the press generally agreed that the author, besides being an incorrigible enthusiast and optimist, was also a woman. But no one ever succeeded in penetrating the veil of anonymity and discovered that Pilgrim and the biologist were one and the same person. Mark Ebor, as Dr. Laidlaw knew him in his laboratory, was one man, but Mark Ebor, as he sometimes saw him after work, was over, with rapt eyes and ecstatic face, discussing the possibilities of union with God and the future of the human race, was quite another. I have always held, as you know, he was saying one evening, as he sat in the little study beyond the laboratory, with his assistant and intimate, that vision should play a large part in the life of the awakened man, not to be regarded as infallible, of course, but to be observed and made use of as a guidepost to possibilities. I am aware of your peculiar views, sir, the young doctor put in deferentially, yet with a certain impatience. For visions come from a region of the consciousness where observation and experiment are out of the question, pursued the other with enthusiasm, not noticing the interruption. And while they should be checked by reason afterwards, they should not be laughed at or ignored. All inspiration, I hold, is of the nature of interior vision, and all our best knowledge has come, such is my confirmed belief, as a sudden revelation to the brain prepared to receive it prepared by hard work first, by concentration, by the closest possible study of ordinary phenomena, Dr. Laidlaw allowed himself to observe. Perhaps, sighed the other, but by a process none the less of spiritual illumination. The best match in the world will not light a candle unless the wick be first suitably prepared. It was Laidlaw's turn to sigh. He knew so well the impossibility of arguing with his chief when he was in the regions of the mystic but at the same time the respect he felt for his tremendous attainments was so sincere that he always listened with attention and deference, wondering how far the great man would go and to what end this curious combination of logic and illumination would eventually lead him. Only last night, continued the elder man, a sort of light coming into his rugged features, the vision came to me again, the one that has haunted me at intervals ever since my youth, and that will not be denied. Dr. Laidlaw fidgeted in his chair. "'About the tablets of the gods, you mean, and that they lie somewhere hidden in the sands,' he said patiently. A sudden gleam of interest came into his face as he turned to catch the professor's reply. "'And that I am to be the one to find them, to decipher them, and to give the great knowledge to the world.' "'Who will not believe?' laughed Laidlaw shortly, yet interested in spite of his thinly veiled contempt." because even the keenest minds in the right sense of the word are hopelessly unscientific, replied the other gently, his face positively aglow with the memory of his vision. Yet 
What is more likely, he continued, after a moment's pause, peering into space, with rapt eyes that saw things too wonderful for exact language to describe, than that there should have been given to man in the first ages of the world some record of the purpose and problem that had been set him to solve. In a word, he cried, fixing his shining eyes upon the face of his perplexed assistant, that God's messengers in the far-off ages should have given to his creatures some full statement of the secret of the world, of the secret of the soul, of the meaning of life and death, the explanation of our being here, and to what great end we are destined in the ultimate fullness of things. Dr. Laidlaw sat speechless. These outbursts of mystical enthusiasm he had witnessed before. With any other man he would not have listened to a single sentence. But to Professor Ebor, man of knowledge and profound investigator, he listened with respect, because he regarded this condition as temporary and pathological, and in some sense a reaction from the intense strain of the prolonged mental concentration of many days. He smiled with something between sympathy and resignation as he met the other's rapt gaze. But you have said, sir, at other times that you consider the ultimate secrets to be screened from all possible— the ultimate secrets, yes, came the unperturbed reply, but that there lies buried somewhere an indestructible record of the secret meaning of life, originally known to men in the days of their pristine innocence, I am convinced. And by this strange vision, so often vouchsafed to me, I am equally sure that one day it shall be given to me to announce to a weary world this glorious and terrific message." and he continued at great length and in glowing language to describe the species of vivid dream that had come to him at intervals since earliest childhood, showing in detail how he discovered these very tablets of the gods and proclaimed their splendid contents, whose precise nature was always, however, withheld from him in the vision, to a patient and suffering humanity. "'The scrutator, sir, well described Pilgrim as the Apostle of Hope,' said the young doctor gently when he had finished." And now, if that reviewer could hear you speak and realize from what strange depths comes your simple faith. The professor held up his hand, and the smile of a little child broke over his face like sunshine in the morning. Half the good my books do would be instantly destroyed, he said sadly. They would say that I wrote with my tongue in my cheek. But wait, he added significantly, wait till I find these tablets of the gods. Wait till I hold the solutions of the old world problems in my hands. Wait till the light of this new revelation breaks upon confused humanity, and it wakes to find its bravest hopes justified. Ah, then, my dear Laidlaw— He broke off suddenly, but the doctor, cleverly guessing the thought in his mind, caught him up immediately. Perhaps this very summer, he said, trying hard to make the suggestion keep pace with honesty. In your explorations in Assyria, your digging in the remote civilization of what was once Chaldea, you may find— what you dream of. The professor held up his hand and the smile of a fine old face. Perhaps, he murmured softly, perhaps. And the young doctor, thanking the gods of science that his leader's aberrations were of so harmless a character, went home strong in the certitude of his knowledge of externals, proud that he was able to refer his visions to self-suggestion, and wondering complacently whether in his old age he might not after all suffer himself from visitations of the very kind that afflicted his respected chief. And as he got into bed and thought again of his master's rugged face, and finely shaped head, and the deep lines traced by years of work and self-discipline, he turned over on his pillow and fell asleep with a sigh that was half of wonder, half of regret. It was in February, nine months later, when Dr. Laidlaw made his way to Charing Cross to meet his chief, after his long absence of travel and exploration. The vision about the so-called tablets of the gods had meanwhile passed almost entirely from his memory. There were few people in the train, for the stream of traffic was now running the other way, and he had no difficulty in finding the man he had come to meet. The shock of white hair beneath the low-crowned felt hat was alone enough to distinguish him by easily. "'Here I am at last!' exclaimed the professor, somewhat wearily, clasping his friend's hand as he listened to the young doctor's warm greetings and questions. "'Here I am, a little older, and much dirtier than when you last saw me.' He glanced down laughingly at his travel-stained garments. "'And much wiser,' said Laidlaw with a smile, as he bustled about the platform for porters and gave his chief the latest scientific news. At last they came down to practical considerations. "'And your luggage, where is that?' "'You must have tons of it, I suppose,' said Laidlaw. "'Hardly anything,' Professor Ebor answered. 
"'Nothing, in fact, but what you see.' "'Nothing but this handbag?' laughed the other, thinking he was joking. "'And a small portmanteau in the van,' was the quiet reply. "'I have no other luggage.' "'You have no other luggage?' repeated Laidlaw, turning sharply to see if he were in earnest. "'Why should I need more?' the professor asked simply. Something in the man's face, or voice, or manner, the doctor hardly knew which, suddenly struck him as strange. There was a change in him, a change so profound, so little on the surface, that is, that at first he had not become aware of it. For a moment it was as though an utterly alien personality stood before him in that noisy, bustling throng. Here, in all the homely, friendly turmoil of a Charing Cross crowd, a curious feeling of cold passed over his heart, touching his life with icy finger, so that he actually trembled and felt afraid. He looked up quickly at his friend, his mind working with startled and unwelcome thoughts. "'Only this?' he repeated, indicating the bag. "'But where's all the stuff you went away with? And have you brought nothing home, no treasures?' "'This is all I have,' the other said briefly. The pale smile that went with the words caused the doctor a second indescribable sensation of uneasiness. Something was very wrong. Something was very queer. He wondered now that he had not noticed it sooner. The rest follows, of course, by slow freight, he added tactfully, and as naturally as possible. But come, sir, you must be tired and in want of food for after your long journey. I'll get a taxi at once, and we can see about the other luggage afterwards. It seemed to him he hardly knew what he was saying. The change in his friend had come upon him so suddenly, and now grew upon him more and more distressingly. Yet he could not make out exactly in what it consisted. A terrible suspicion began to take shape in his mind, troubling him dreadfully. "'I'm neither very tired nor in need of food, thank you,' the professor said quietly. "'And this is all I have. There is no luggage to follow. I have brought home nothing, nothing but what you see.' His words conveyed finality. They got into a taxi, tipped the porter, who had been staring in amazement at the venerable figure of the scientist, and were conveyed slowly and noisily to the house in the north of London, where the laboratory was, the scene of their labors of years. And the whole way Professor Ebor uttered no word, nor did Dr. Laidlaw find the courage to ask a single question. It was only late that night before he took his departure, as the two men were standing before the fire in the study that study where they had discussed so many problems of vital and absorbing interest that dr laidlaw at last found strength to come to the point with direct questions the professor had been giving him a superficial and desultory account of his travels of his journeys by camel of his encampments among the mountains and in the desert and of his explorations among the buried temples and deeper into the waste of the prehistoric sands when suddenly the doctor came to the desired point with a kind of nervous rush almost like a frightened boy. And, and you found, he began stammering, looking hard at the other's dreadfully altered face, from which every line of hope and cheerfulness seemed to have been obliterated, as a sponge wipes markings from a slate. You, you found? I found, replied the other in a solemn voice, and it was the voice of the mystic rather than the man of science. I found what I went to seek. The vision never once failed me. It led me straight to the place like a star in the heavens. I found the tablets of the gods. Dr. Laidlaw caught his breath and steadied himself on the back of a chair. The words fell like particles of ice upon his heart. For the first time the professor had uttered the well-known phrase without the glow of light and wonder in his face that had always accompanied it. You have brought them, he faltered. I have brought them home, said the other, in a voice with a ring like iron, and I have deciphered them. Profound despair, the bloom of outer darkness, the dead sound of a hopeless soul freezing in the utter cold of space seemed to fill in the pauses between the brief sentences. A silence followed, during which Dr. Laidlaw saw nothing but the white face before him alternately fade and return, and it was like the face of a dead man. They are, alas, indestructible, he heard the voice continue with its even, metallic ring. Indestructible, Laidlaw repeated mechanically, hardly knowing what he was saying. Again a silence of several minutes passed, during which, with a creeping cold about his heart, 
He stood and stared into the eyes of the man he had known and loved so long. I and worshipped, too. The man who had first opened his own eyes when they were blind, and had led him to the gates of knowledge, and no little distance along the difficult path beyond. The man who, in another direction, had passed on the strength of his faith into the hearts of thousands by his books. "'I may see them?' he asked at last, in a low voice he hardly recognized as his own. "'You will let me know their message?' Professor Ivor kept his eyes fixedly upon his assistant's face as he answered, with a smile that was more like the grin of death than a living human smile. "'When I am gone,' he whispered, "'when I have passed away, then you shall find them and read the translation I have made. And then, too, in your turn, you must try, with the latest resources of science at your disposal to aid you, to compass their utter destruction.' He paused a moment, and his face grew pale as the face of a corpse. "'Until that time,' he added presently, without looking up, "'I must ask you not to refer to the subject again, and to keep my confidence meanwhile absolutely.'" A year passed slowly by, and at the end of it Dr. Laidlaw had found it necessary to sever his working connection with his friend and one-time leader. Professor Ebor was no longer the same man— the light had gone out of his life. The laboratory was closed. He no longer put pen to paper or applied his mind to a single problem. In the short space of a few months he had passed from a hale and hearty man of late middle life to the condition of old age, a man collapsed and on the edge of dissolution. Death, it was plain, lay waiting for him in the shadows of any day, and he knew it. To describe faithfully the nature of this profound alteration in his character and temperament is not easy, but Dr. Laidlaw summed it up to himself in three words. Loss of hope. The splendid mental powers remained indeed undimmed, but the incentive to use them, to use them for the help of others, had gone. The character still held to its fine and unselfish habits of years, but the far goal to which they had been the leading strings had faded away. The desire for knowledge, knowledge for its own sake, had died, and the passionate hope which hitherto had animated with tireless energy the heart and brain of this splendidly equipped intellect had suffered total eclipse. The central fires had gone out. Nothing was worth doing, thinking, working for. There was nothing to work for any longer. The professor's first step was to recall as many of his books as possible. His second to close his laboratory and stop all research. He gave no explanation, he invited no questions. His whole personality crumbled away, so to speak, till his daily life became a mere mechanical process of clothing the body, feeding the body, keeping it in good health so as to avoid physical discomfort, and above all, doing nothing that could interfere with sleep. The professor did everything he could to lengthen the hours of sleep, and therefore of forgetfulness. It was all clear enough to Dr. Laidlaw. A weaker man, he knew, would have sought to lose himself in one form or another of sensual indulgence. Sleeping draughts, drink, the first pleasures that came to hand. Self-destruction would have been the method of a little bolder type, and deliberate evil-doing, poisoning with his awful knowledge all he could, the means of still another kind of man. Mark Ebar was none of these. He held himself under fine control facing silently and without complaint the terrible facts he honestly believed himself to have been unfortunate enough to discover. Even to his intimate friend and assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, he vouchsafed no word of true explanation or lament. He went straight forward to the end, knowing well that the end was not very far away. And death came very quietly one day to him, as he was sitting in the armchair of the study, directly facing the doors of the laboratory the doors that no longer opened. Dr. Laidlaw, by happy chance, was with him at the time, and just able to reach his side in response to the sudden painful efforts for breath, just in time, too, to catch the murmured words that fell from the pallid lips like a message from the other side of the grave. Read them, if you must, and if you can. Destroy. But— His voice sank so low that Dr. Laidlaw only just caught the dying syllables— but never, never give them to the world. And like a gray bundle of dust, loosely gathered up in an old garment, the professor sank back into his chair 
and expired. But this was only the death of the body. His spirit had died two years before. The estate of the dead man was small and uncomplicated, and Dr. Laidlaw, as sole executor and residuary legatee, had no difficulty in settling it up. A month after the funeral he was sitting alone in his upstairs library, the last sad duties completed, and his mind full of poignant memories and regrets for the loss of a friend he had revered and loved, and to whom his debt was so incalculably great. The last two years, indeed, had been for him terrible— to watch the swift decay of the greatest combination of heart and brain he had ever known, and to realize he was powerless to help, was a source of profound grief to him that would remain to the end of his days. At the same time, an insatiable curiosity possessed him. The study of dementia was, of course, outside his special province as a specialist, but he knew enough of it to understand how small a matter might be the actual cause of how great an illusion, and he had been devoured from the very beginning by a ceaseless and increasing anxiety to know what the professor had found in the sands of Chaldea, what these precious tablets of the gods might be, and particularly, for this was the real cause that had sapped the man's sanity and hope, what the inscription was that he had believed to have deciphered thereon. The curious feature of it all, to his own mind, was that whereas his friend had dreamed of finding a message of glorious hope and comfort, he had apparently found, so far as he had found anything intelligible at all, and not invented the whole thing in his dementia, that the secret of the world, and the meaning of life and death, was of so terrible a nature that it robbed the heart of courage and the soul of hope. What, then, could be the contents of the little brown parcel the professor had bequeathed to him with his pregnant, dying sentences? Actually, his hand was trembling as he turned to the writing-table and began slowly to unfasten a small, old-fashioned desk, on which the small gilt initials M.E. stood forth as a melancholy memento. He put the key into the lock and half-turned it. Then suddenly he stopped and looked about him. Was that a sound at the back of the room? It was just as though someone had laughed and then tried to smother the laugh with a cough. A slight shiver ran over him as he stood listening. "'This is absurd,' he said aloud. "'Too absurd for belief that I should be so nervous. "'It's the effect of curiosity unduly prolonged.' He smiled a little sadly, and his eyes wandered to the blue summer sky and the plain trees swaying in the wind below his window. "'It's the reaction,' he continued, "'the curiosity of two years to be quenched in a single moment. "'The nervous tension, of course, must be considerable.' He turned back to the brown desk and opened it without further delay. His hand was firm now, and he took out the paper parcel that lay inside without a tremor. It was heavy. A moment later there lay on the table before him a couple of weather-worn plaques of gray stone. They looked like stone, although they felt like metal, on which he saw markings of a curious character that might have been the mere tracings of natural forces through the ages or equally well, the half-obliterated hieroglyphics cut upon their surface in past centuries by the more or less untutored hand of a common scribe. He lifted each stone in turn and examined it carefully. It seemed to him that a faint glow of heat passed from the substance into his skin, and he put them down again suddenly, as with a gesture of uneasiness. A very clever or a very imaginative man, he said to himself, who could squeeze the secrets of life and death from such broken lines as these. Then he turned to a yellow envelope lying beside them in the desk, with the single word on the outside in the writing of the professor, the word translation. Now, he thought, taking it up with a sudden violence to conceal his nervousness, now for the great solution. Now to learn the meaning of the worlds, and why mankind was made, and why discipline is worth while, and sacrifice and pain the true law of advancement. There was the shadow of a sneer in his voice, and yet something in him shivered at the same time. He held the envelope as though weighing it in his hand, his mind pondering many things. Then curiosity won the day, and he suddenly tore it open with the gesture of an actor, who tears open a letter on the stage, knowing there is no real writing inside at all. A page of finely written script in the late scientist's handwriting lay before him. He read it through from beginning to end, missing no word, uttering each syllable distinctly under his breath as he read. 
The pallor of his face grew ghastly as he neared the end. He began to shake all over as with a g u e His breath came heavily in gasps. He still gripped the sheet of paper, however, and deliberately, as by an intense effort of will, read it through a second time from beginning to end. And this time, as the last syllable dropped from his lips, the whole face of the man flamed with a sudden and terrible anger. His skin became deep, deep red, and he clenched his teeth. With all the strength of his vigorous soul, he was struggling to keep control of himself. For perhaps five minutes he stood there beside the table without stirring a muscle. He might have been carved out of stone. His eyes were shut, and only the heaving of the chest betrayed the fact that he was a living being. Then, with a strange quietness, he lit a match and applied it to the sheet of paper he held in his hand. The ashes fell slowly about him, piece by piece, and he blew them from the window sill into the air, his eyes following them. As they floated away on the summer wind that breathed so warmly over the world. He turned back slowly into the room. Although his actions and movements were absolutely steady and controlled, it was clear that he was on the edge of violent action. A hurricane might burst upon the still room at any moment. His muscles were tense and rigid. Then suddenly he whitened, collapsed, and sank backwards into a chair like a tumbled bundle of inert matter. He had fainted. In less than half an hour he recovered consciousness and sat up. As before, he made no sound. Not a syllable passed his lips. He rose quietly and looked about the room. Then he did a curious thing. Taking a heavy stick from the rack in the corner, he approached the mantelpiece, and with a heavy shattering blow he smashed the clock to pieces. The glass fell in shivering atoms. Cease your lying voice forever, he said in a curiously still, even tone. There is no such thing as time. He took the watch from his pocket, swung it round several times by the long gold chain, smashed it into smithereens against the wall with a single blow, and then walked into his laboratory next door and hung its broken body on the bones of the skeleton in the corner of the room. Let one damned mockery hang upon another, he said, smiling oddly. Delusions, both of you, and cruel as false. He slowly moved back to the front room. He stopped opposite the bookcase where stood in a row the scriptures of the world, choicely bound and exquisitely printed, the late professor's most treasured possession, and next to them several books signed Pilgrim. One by one he took them from the shelf and hurled them through the open window. A devil's dreams! Of devil's foolish dreams! he cried with a vicious laugh. Presently he stopped from sheer exhaustion. He turned his eyes slowly to the wall opposite, where hung a weird array of eastern swords and daggers, scimitars and spears, the collections of many journeys. He crossed the room and ran his finger along the edge. His mind seemed to waver. No, he muttered presently, not that way. There are easier and better ways than that. He took his hat and passed downstairs into the street. It was five o'clock. And the June sun lay hot upon the pavement. He felt the metal doorknob burn the palm of his hand. Ah, Laidlaw, this is well met, cried a voice at his elbow. I was in the act of coming to see you. I've a case that will interest you, and besides, I remember that you flavored your tea with orange leaves, and I admit it was Alexis Stephen, the great hypnotic doctor. I've had no tea today, Laidlaw said in a dazed manner, after staring for a moment, as though the other had struck him in the face. A new idea had entered his mind. What's the matter? asked Dr. Stephen quickly. Something's wrong with you. It's this sudden heat, or overwork. Come, man, let's go inside. A sudden light broke upon the face of the younger man, the light of a heaven sent inspiration. He looked into his friend's face and told a direct lie. Odd, he said. I myself was just coming to see you. I have something of great importance to test your confidence with. But in your house, please, as Stephen urged him towards his own door. In your house. It's only around the corner, and I. I cannot go back there, to my rooms, till I've told you. I'm your patient for the moment, he added stammeringly, as soon as they were seated in the privacy of the hypnotist's sanctum, and I want. the.、Uh, my dear Laidlaw, interrupted the other, in that soothing voice of command which had suggested to many a suffering soul that the cure for its pain lay in the powers of its own reawakened will. I am always at your service, as you know, 
you have only to tell me what I can do for you, and I will do it. He showed every desire to help him out. His manner was indescribably tactful and direct. Dr. Laidlaw looked up into his face. I surrender my will to you, he said, already calmed by the other's healing presence. And I want you to treat me hypnotically, and at once. I want you to suggest to me, his voice became very tense, that I shall forget, forget till I die, everything that has occurred to me during the last two hours. Till I die, mind, he added with solemn emphasis, till I die. He floundered and stammered like a frightened boy. Alexis Stephen looked at him fixedly, without speaking. And further, Laidlaw continued, I want you to ask me no questions. I wish to forget for ever something I have recently discovered, something so terrible and yet so obvious that I can hardly understand why it is not patent to every mind in the world, for I have had a moment of absolutely clear vision, of merciless clairvoyance, but I want no one else in the world to know what it is, least of all, old friend, yourself. He talked in utter confusion and hardly knew what he was saying but the pain on his face and the anguish in his voice were an instant passport to the other's heart. "'Nothing is easier,' replied Dr. Stephen, after a hesitation so slight that the other probably did not even notice it. "'Come into my other room, where we shall not be disturbed. I can heal you. Your memory of the last two hours shall be wiped out as though it had never been. You can trust me, absolutely.' "'I know I can,' Laidlaw said simply, as he followed him in. An hour later they passed back into the front room again. The sun was already behind the houses opposite, and the shadows began to gather. "'I went off easily?' Laidlaw asked. "'You were a little obstinate at first, but though you came in like a lion, you went out like a lamb. I let you sleep a bit afterwards.' Dr. Stephen kept his eyes rather steadily upon his friend's face. "'What were you doing by the fire before you came here?' he asked, pausing in a casual tone, as he lit a cigarette and handed the case to his patient. I, let me see, oh, I know, I was worrying my way through poor old Ebor's papers and things. I'm his executor, you know. Then I got weary and came out for a whiff of air. He spoke lightly and with perfect naturalness. Obviously, he was telling the truth. I prefer specimens to papers, he laughed cheerily. I know, I know, said Dr. Stephen, holding a lighted match for the cigarette. His face wore an expression of content. The experiment had been a complete success. The memory of the last two hours was wiped out utterly. Laidlaw was already chatting gaily and easily about a dozen other things that interested him. Together they went out into the street, and at his door Dr. Stephen left him with a joke and a wry face that made his friend laugh heartily. "'Don't dine on the professor's old papers by mistake,' he cried as he vanished down the street. Dr. Laidlaw went up to his study at the top of the house. Halfway down he met his housekeeper, Mrs. Fewings. She was flustered and excited, and her face was very red and perspiring. "'There have been burglars here,' she cried excitedly, "'or something funny. All your things is just anyhow, sir. I found everything all about everywhere.' She was very confused. In this orderly and very precise establishment it was unusual to find a thing out of place. "'Oh, my specimens!' cried the doctor, dashing up the rest of the stairs at top speed. "'Have they been touched, or—' He flew to the door of the laboratory. Mrs. Fewings panted up heavily behind him. "'The laboratory ain't been touched,' she explained breathlessly. "'But they smashed the library clock, and they've hung your gold watch, sir, on the skeleton's hands. And the books that weren't no value they flung out of the window just like so much rubbish. They must have been wild drunk, Dr. Laidlaw, sir.' The young scientist made a hurried examination of the rooms. Nothing of value was missing. He began to wonder what kind of burglars they were. He looked up sharply at Mrs. Fewings standing in the doorway. For a moment he seemed to cast about in his mind for something. "'Odd,' he said at length. "'I only left here an hour ago, and everything was all right then.' "'Was it, sir?' "'Yes, sir.' She glanced sharply at him. Her room looked out upon the courtyard, and she must have seen the books come crashing down, and also have heard her master leave the house a few minutes later. "'And what's this rubbish the brutes have left?' he cried, taking up two slabs of worn grey stone on the writing-table. "'Bath brick or something, I do declare!' He looked very sharply again at the confused and troubled housekeeper. "'Throw them on the dust-heap, Mrs. Fewings, and—and and let me know if anything is missing in the house, and I will notify the police this evening.' When she left the room he went into the laboratory and took his watch off the skeleton's fingers. His face wore a troubled expression, but after a moment's thought it cleared again. His memory was a complete blank. 
"'I suppose I left it on the writing-table when I went out to take the air,' he said. "'And there was no one present to contradict him. "'He crossed to the window and blew carelessly some ashes of burned paper from the sill, "'and stood watching them as they floated away lazily over the tops of the trees. "'End of The Man Who Found Out'